I'm Greg Faulkner. I'm the senior pastor and head of staff at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, near the end of Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics, he writes about Jesus Christ as true witness with these words. It is in this form of suffering as the holy rejected, judged, despised, bound, impotent, slain, and crucified, and therefore as the victor, that Christ marches with us and to us through the times, alive in the promise of the Spirit, in this form unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. He has addressed his own, his community, and through this the world, from the time of his resurrection onwards and therefore from the very first. He has continually proffered himself to the church and the world in this form. He encounters us in this form or not at all. To look past it is not to see him. To miss the word of the cross is not to hear him. Our speaker tonight, one of the first women ordained to the Episcopal priesthood, has over 40 years of her ordained ministry been someone who has borne witness to the true witness, Jesus Christ. I first heard Fleming here in this building, Stuart Hall. It was downstairs in one of the smaller classrooms. I was an MDiv student. A new instructor in homiletics, Jim Kay, was teaching our class. He came with a cassette player. Some of you will remember those. And told us we would listen to a sermon by an Episcopal pastor who was something of a modern day Puritan preacher in Manhattan. Dr. K went on to tell us that he called Mrs. Rutledge a Puritan preacher because she stuck to the word and served God by doing her best to be a faithful witness to that word, making sure that her hearers did not pass that word of the cross lest we miss Christ. That was nearly 30 years ago. Fleming was then on the staff of Grace Church in New York City. Perhaps when she preached that sermon in somewhere around 1989, the sermon to which our class of seminarians were listening to attentively, Fleming could not imagine then what bearing witness to the true witness would lead. For her, it led, after over 22 years of ministry in the parish, to a new vocation of international preaching and teaching. For the last quarter of a century, most of us have known Fleming through her books, as well as videos of her sermons and lectures. And we know that from the beginning of her ministry, it has been as it is now a ministry to and for the word. It'll come as no surprise then that in her first book, the first sermon that you find there in the Bible in the New York Times is a sermon on Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from what is heard and what is heard comes by the preaching of Christ. While the church has benefited from Fleming's eight books, it is we preachers who have been special beneficiaries from her labors. I doubt that I'm the only person present this evening who has not borrowed from Fleming's books. A story, a turn of the phrase, but I would argue that what is more important is how she has worked to bear witness to the crucified and risen Lord. She has been a teacher, but also a fellow laborer in the vineyard. And we have benefited from her wisdom and her toil in that vineyard because she is always calling us, but also helping us to preach Christ and him crucified. Throughout all of her works, the crucified victor is never far away from center stage. So it would not surprise any of us that what has now become her magnum opus, the crucifixion, understanding the death of Jesus Christ, has been a place, has taken a place of great importance in the theological world. I don't know about you, but I cannot recall a book of theology that has amassed the kind of responses garnered by Rutledge's The Crucifixion. What other book can have the high praise of a South African Reformed theologian like Dirk Schmidt and the Roman Catholic bishop Robert Barrett? Both Eastern Orthodox systematic theologian David Bentley Hart and the post-liberal ethicist Stanley Harwas have said that this is an important work. And among the new Calvinists, Andrew Wilson last year wrote on the Gospel Coalition website that Rutledge's book on the crucifixion was a book of beauty and magnificence. 
this lavishly and rightly praised book, which Fleming says is the work of a lifetime, is like all of her works, a true gift to scholars. But I'm going to say that it's perhaps even more a gift to me and to those like me who every week must face the challenge of bearing witness to the word of the cross. It is her service as preacher and teacher of the true witness, Jesus Christ, that has empowered her 40 years of ministry and its impact on so many. From the beginning, Fleming Rulledge has been a minister who has followed like Bart in saying to miss the word of the cross is not to hear him. He is the true witness to which we must bear. And to this, she has borne witness indeed. We are grateful for Fleming's preaching. We are grateful to welcome her once again to Princeton Theological Seminary and once again to the Bart's Pastor Conference. Our speaker tonight, Fleming Rutledge. I've known Greg a while and, and I've been in his parish, his congregation, and I know how respected he is and loved, but I've never heard him speak before because <laughs> I'm always in the pulpit when I, that was elegant. Thank you. Beautifully done, no matter what the content. It was just so elegant. And I can understand why you are so respected. And I appreciate it. Now, I'm sure there's some of you out there who know something about genre. Genre. So when I finish, you can tell me what genre this is. I think of it as a, well, it's not an address. It's not a sermon. It's not a lecture. I was thinking of it as an after-dinner speech. <laughs> You'll have to tell me <laughs> what it is. Anyway, I know I'm in good company because I'm going to begin with a prayer of Dr. Samuel Johnson, author of the first English dictionary. Almighty God, giver of all good things, without whose help all labor is ineffectual, and without whose grace all wisdom is folly, grant, I beseech thee, that in this my undertaking, thy Holy Spirit may not be withheld from me, but that I may promote thy glory and the salvation both of myself and others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the year 1962, Karl Barth came to the United States the country he regarded suspiciously as a place where they believed in the freedom of the will. It was the year that he was on the cover of Time magazine. Those were the days. <laughs> he delivered a lecture at Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. And I, age 24, a bride living in Richmond, was among the hundreds who turned out to hear him. Not only could I not understand his Swiss-German accent, I was not equipped to understand what he was talking about either. The only thing I remember about the great occasion is that on the way out, I overheard an Episcopal clergyman whom I knew grumbling to another Episcopal clergyman, he has no theology of the church. <laughs> I've been pondering that ever since 1962. Last month, before the present crisis about the immigrant children held hostage to a political cause, the New York Times published a report about the support for Donald Trump and his policies among so-called evangelicals. I'm sure you've seen the articles. Indignant letters to the editor appeared in the paper a few days later, a couple of days later. Two or three of them were from self-confessed, self-identified Christians expressing dismay 
in terms that I imagine most of us here would agree with. One of these well-meaning letter writers begins this way. If Jesus were alive today, someone on Twitter responded that Jesus would be rolling over in his grave. Will Willimon has said that the foundational problem with the Jesus Seminar was that, his, that its members conducted all of their deliberations out of the basic assumption that Jesus is dead. But the Jesus Seminar is not the only place that we meet this assumption. We find it in the church all the time. I assume that most of you preach on a regular basis, so you don't get around the church and hear as many sermons as I do. I don't think I've heard any of you preach, so you may consider yourselves absolved from what I'm getting ready to say. <laughs> I have heard many hundreds of sermons in the mainline churches all over the country in the past couple of decades, and a great many of them seem to assume that Jesus is alive only insofar as we follow a particular version of his commandments. And I thought about that when Chris, Christian was talking this morning. Now this assumption that Jesus is alive only in our following of him in a particular way. This leads to a fatal homiletical outcome. The congregation is reminded of the correct attitude concerning the presenting issues of the day and is then exhorted to get busy addressing them. Therein, it is implied, lies salvation. Therefore, the living presence of the Lord is not felt in these sermons. I've come to believe with some good reason over the years that the power of the living Christ is so little known in many of our congregations, and to be sure, a lot of them have been in New England. <laughs> Alas, for the Puritans. So little known in many of our congregations that they might not know it if they beheld it which might indicate to the preacher sh that she should shake the dust off of the church, off of that church, off her feet. That thought has occurred to me quite a few times in my travels around the church. Now you can see the Time Magazine cover of BART and the display in the library, and there are wonderful things in that display, and I hope you'll pay lots of attention to it. It's really special. BART's portrait is very stern and off-putting on the cover of time. But in the background, there's a drawing, a depiction of the empty tomb. Today, more than 55 years later, seeing that old-fashioned cover design still makes an impact on me, at any rate. The Lord whom Bart served is risen from the dead and powerfully at work among us. You'll see also in the display cases several recent volumes, I'm sure they're also in the book display, several recent volumes mostly edited by the prodigiously productive George Hunzinger, volumes about Bart and radical politics. One of the areas of his thought that interests me the most, although I know it mostly at second hand. Along the lines of radical politics, I'd like to salute the fondly remembered journal called Catalagate. Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Hey, good. Long defunct, but I've recently learned not altogether dead. Phil Ziegler of the University of Aberdeen told me that he had discovered a pile of old issues of Cat in a seminary library and that he read them cover to cover. The editors of CAT were the great Will Campbell and his cohort, Jim Holloway. 
they took BART very seriously in the realm of radical politics. The thing to note about Catalagate in the 60s and 70s, I now realize, was and is that it espoused radical politics, but not identity politics. That was a difficult lesson to learn in the maelstrom of the early 70s when I entered Union Theological Seminary in New York. The year 1968 was not even five years past. There was intense pressure on us students to line up for identity politics. Classrooms were in the process of becoming like university campuses today, with various groups claiming, claiming the high ground for themselves. Like the Pharisee in Jesus' parable, trusting in themselves that they were righteous and despise others. It was in the process of trying to find my way among these claims it really was kind of funny now that I look back on it. Here I was, a suburban housewife from Westchester County, trying to be more feminist than thou <laughs> in order to win the approval of the Women's Caucus. A doctoral student whose name I don't remember told me that I ought to read the strange new world of the Bible. It was like the nameless little servant girl telling Naaman the leper to go to the prophet Elisha. Whoever that student was saw me floundering around and directed me into the current that carried me into the river of life. That short, early essay of Bart's was the first thing of his that I ever read. If anyone here wants to introduce somebody to Bart, the strange new world of the Bible is a good place to begin. I discovered a long time ago that once you get to know the way that Bart thinks, you can pick up his work just about anywhere. An amateur like myself can pick up, I'm not saying that in self-deprecation, I'm not a scholar, I'm not a systematic theologian, but I learned that you can pick up his work and almost put your finger on a page and you will find something that you can build upon. This is one of the remarkable aspects of living with Bart all of your life. Christopher Morse taught me this in my first year at Union, that because the word of God is a unity, systematic theology is also a unity. Everything in the church dogmatics followed through its manifold convolutions eventually doubles back on itself, defining and illuminating everything else. Just as scripture interprets itself. Now, of course, you, will, um, you know that there are some difficulties getting younger people to read Bart in today's climate. For one thing, speaking of identity politics, you have to get used to the constant use of the word man in a generic sense, and it's not so easy to solve this just by translating it differently. But of course, it is well worth the effort to accustom oneself to his way of speaking. For instance, Further along in the same early essay collection, the, the Word of God and the Word of Man, I found a sentence that breaks several rules of contemporary communication, not only in form but also in substance. Here is that sentence in all of its offensiveness. <laughs> Quoting Bart now. Man condemns himself to death by the question about the good because the only certain answer to the question about the good is that he, the human being, is not good. And from the viewpoint of the good is powerless. How does that sound to the average reader? Wouldn't you think that this line of reasoning would sever the nerve of action for once and for all? On the contrary, 
I remember how I felt when I read that sentence. This gospel message frees you from the tyranny of the thought that everything depends on you. As Pascal wrote, be comforted. It is not from yourself that you must expect it. On the contrary, you must expect it by expecting nothing from yourself. Expecting by not expecting. This is very much like the paradox that Bart loved from Second Peter, waiting and hastening. He loved that, waiting and hastening. Two contradictory ideas. I've just finished putting together a new sermon collection for Advent, and I've noticed once again that the paradoxical themes of Advent are everywhere in the church dogmatics from beginning to end. The now and the not yet the whence and the whither, the once and the future. None of it makes any sense if Jesus is dead. The radical gospel depends on the truth of the announcement. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Otherwise, we are thrown back on ourselves with only the memory of a dead Jesus and delusions of human grandeur to keep us going. I don't always remember where I read stuff, but just the other day, I found something right on target. The writer, whoever it was, complained that the church was always talking about building the kingdom, but it seemed to be a kingdom without a king. If Jesus isn't alive and coming again, then who is going to be the king of the kingdom? Well, of course, that's the nasty little secret. We harbor the notion that we ourselves are going to be the kings and queens of our kingdom, of the kingdom, through our own efforts. And here's what Bart says about that. <clears throat> this is from all of these quotes happen to be from the first, the, from the first volume, second part, one, two, in other words. That's what I brought with me, volume two. Volume one, part two, yes. This is what Bart says about our own efforts. This is partly my paraphrase and partly his actual words. If the promise of Jesus that he will be with us even to the end of the age is only a pleasing religious memory, there will be nothing left of the church but a human community which is puffed up with the illusion that it has inherited the kingdom task all to itself, an illusion that works its own revenge upon the church. The illusion that we can carry out the kingdom task by ourselves works its own revenge upon the church. The way I hear it in sermons, which are very popular in the Episcopal Church right now, is that God has a dream. Amen. And we are to fulfill God's dream. I don't remember anything in scripture about God having a dream, do you? <laughs> this illusion that works its own revenge upon the church, is dramatized with considerable effect at the conclusion of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And I'll put in a little plug for my book about the Lord of the Rings, which I think is, which is my favorite of all my books. Many readers of the saga miss the point that I'm getting ready to illuminate, uh, not illuminate, I'm getting ready to talk about it. Um, Many readers of the saga miss this point because it comes at the end after the great climax in the action. And this theme is entirely absent from the movie. In Tolkien's private letters, he explains that to the very end, Frodo was profoundly affected by the allure of the ring. 
long after the victory over the demonic power of Sauron, Frodo continued to suffer from, I'm quoting now from Tolkien, Frodo continued to suffer from a last flicker of pride. He was not content with being a mere instrument of good. He was not content, that is, to be solely God's servant with all that implies of his own diminishment. He needed to undergo a cleansing, a truer understanding of his position in littleness and greatness. He was not able, Tolkien continues, to accept himself as a mere agent or vessel of providence. From another point of view, C.S. Lewis elucidates this predicament superbly at the end of Paralandra. The principal character, Ransom, you'll remember, is overwhelmed by the magnitude of what has been accomplished in the victory won over the devil. The archangel speaks to Ransom in these words. Be comforted. It is no doing of yours. You are not great. Be comforted, small one, in your smallness. He lays no merit on you. Receive and be glad. God lays no merit on you. I first read that 45 years ago, and it has been an incredible comfort to me ever since. I think Bart, in his own person, sometimes exemplified this. He was, of course, famously irascible, especially about those who disagreed with him. And he fully understood the magnitude of the task he had set for himself, but in his letters, and late writings, as you know, and we're so lucky because we're going to get more of these late writings and letters, his humorous self-deprecation has the ring of authenticity, I think. The angels laugh, he famously says. The angels laugh at old Carl with his wheelbarrows full of church dogmatics. There's so much freedom in that. Bart's humor and joy are among the greatest benefits of reading his letters and conversations. And we are to have these marvelous volumes now coming out. So, all these thoughts arise out of the revelation that Jesus Christ is not dead, but alive. It is not for nothing that the central thing remembered in the Christian community about Martin Luther King is the kitchen epiphany when close to total despair, he sensed Jesus promising him that he would always be with him, that he would never be alone. No, never alone. There are many areas of theology that Dr. King left unexplored, but whatever doctrinal deficiencies there may have been, in the story of his life, we see the presence of a Lord who is not dead, but living the Lord who guarantees his own promises, the God who, as they say, is able. The African-American church is presently experiencing some of the same attrition as the mainline white churches, but it still preserves its traditional emphasis on the God who makes a way out of no way, the God who redeems the unredeemable. That is what undergirds black people's astonishing offers of forgiveness for the unforgivable, redemption for the unredeemable. All of our churches could use a lot more of what Robert Farah Capon wrote, God did not come to love the lovable and improve the improvable, but to raise the dead. How curious to reflect upon the idea of a dead Jesus raising the dead. When I was a young preacher, I learned a lesson. 
I was invited in these early days of my ministry, invited to preach to a congregation in a very liberal church in Richmond, Virginia, as a matter of fact. I was very innocent of such contexts in those days, and I preached innocently, as it were, on the text about Jesus raising the daughter of Jairus. It was reported to me afterwards that people were scandalized that the preacher appeared to believe what she was preaching. <laughs> I made up my mind that day that I would always preach a Lord who raises the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, and that I would trust him to do the same with my preaching, even when I was saying something that seemed, even to me, to be unbelievable. Living with Bart for decades enables us to believe and to trust that the Holy Spirit has not gone missing from the living word of the living Lord. Speaking of Bart's doctrine of the church, <laughs> or lack thereof, I brought volume one, part two, with me to Princeton, and I searched out some passages about the church to help us, perhaps, with our preaching in this crisis that we are in. Actually, I suppose we are always in a crisis of one sort or another. I, I remember Paul Lehman, vis, vis, <clears throat> excuse me. I remember Paul Lehman vociferously insisting that the church was in a status confessionis in the Reagan years. How comparatively innocent those years now seem. In any case, I did find much comfort and strength in Bart's pages on the Holy Spirit, the subjective reality of revelation. Here, Bart is at pains to show that there is no gospel without the church. In the small print, he shows how the Apostle Paul, for instance, does not exist except in his function in the life of the church. Existence in Christ, Bart writes, and existence in the church are seen and understood as an actual unity. He then offers a number of significant quotations from six of the fathers to illustrate this same point. before he moves on to Luther, whom he quotes approvingly. This is Luther. Whoever would find Christ must first find the churches. How would we know where Christ and his faith were if we did not know where his faithful are? For without the Christian church, there is no truth, no Christ, no blessedness. Christ will not exist except as his function in the life of the church. But as we are beginning to wonder where Christ and his truth might be hidden in the scripture quoting of our Attorney General at Liberty University or in the preaching of Franklin Graham, Bart reminds us, again I'm quoting, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, the word written not only does not minister life, it ministers death. Amen. Bart goes on. Where the church is, there also we have always this church which is not the church. That is, in the church, the work of sin and apostasy is always going on as well. There is no time, Bart continues, there is no time at which, to a greater or less degree, the church does not also have the appearance of such an apostate church. But although there is in it no lack of man's upstart arbitrariness, it nevertheless exists in dependence on Jesus Christ. 
and it is because the church lives by Jesus Christ, not because it is constantly involved in upstart and arbitrary action, that it is the true church. At this point, thinking about the two churches that always exist together until the new eon, at this point I tend to hear again the voice of Will Campbell speaking to me many years ago. After listening to me complaining about racists, he said, Fleming, we're all racists. Amen. We who are so proud of our enlightened attitudes need to be on our knees repenting of our self-satisfaction and self-righteousness every single day for the rest of our lives. I remember also the words of P.T. Forsyth as follows. Many preach Christ but get in front of him by the multiplicity of their own works. I wonder how your church describes itself. I've been collecting church self-descriptions for some time. <laughs> we are a warm, welcoming, nurturing, diverse, non-discriminating, inclusive, embracing, affirmative congregation. Talk about multiplicity of works. We feed the poor. We recycle plastic. <laughs> We march for justice, we fly rainbow flags, we, re we oppose oppression, we practice radical hospitality. You would think the second coming had already occurred. How about this for your church letterhead? We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts, and there is no health in us. <laughs> Thomas Cranmer. Here is Bart's voice again. Man condemns himself to death by the question about the good because the only certain answer to the question about the good is that he, the human being, is not good and from the point of the good is powerless. Now the paradox is that this truth sets us free. It is the difference between if, then, and because, therefore. Because in Christ we have been delivered from the world of merit and demerit. Therefore, we are new men and women. In the strange new world of the Bible, there is a new creation. Because, therefore. I want to leave you with the epistolary conversational voice of Bart. Years ago, I read a volume of Bart's letters and found one in particular that has accompanied me ever since, and particularly now as I'm beginning to grow old. This is a letter that John, that Paul, I, Paul, John, <laughs> Luke, Matthew. Um, <laughs> this is a letter that Bart wrote to John Godsey during a bout of the Ill illness that eventually caused his, Bart's, death. And I'm reading now verbatim from the letter of Bart to John Godsey. When you visited me in the year 1965, I still did not have the slightest idea that the most difficult part of my ordeal still lay before me. A few days afterward, I had to re-enter the hospital and there remained there for four months undergo a second operation and take many, many kinds of medicine. Somewhere within me there lives a bacillus with the name Proteus Mirabilis, which has an inclination to enter my kidneys, which would then mean my finish. I am certain that this monstrosity does not belong to God's good creation but rather has come in as a result of the fall. It has in common with sin and with the demons also 
that it cannot simply be done away with, but can only be despised, combated, and suppressed. In the case of Proteus Mirabilis, that was, and still is, the task of the doctors, beside whom also good nurses have worked on me night and day. Apart from this, however, I am getting along better, often extraordinarily well. The main thing is the knowledge that God makes no mistakes and that Proteus Mirabilis has no chance against him.